So the paper, the paper is really good. Thank you. Will we hit into it? How long have it been, has it been just rumbling in your head for a long time? Literally decades, because in the late 80s, I begin, you know, that, that's like w when I learn how to use a spreadsheet. And the first thing I'm doing is like, okay, let me simulate this and simulate that. And, you know, I was working on the Okisho theorem and the refutation of that. And like, well, you know, let, let's say we've got uh, labor-saving technological change and the means of production grow faster than, you know, the new value added by living labor. And what what are the consequences of that? And it was like obvious to me that no reasonable process of technological change generated a breakdown. I mean, I just didn't see it anywhere. You know, you get a falling rate of profit, you got all kinds of things going on, but you don't get a, a situation of zero profit from new investment and, and a breakdown and all of that. And, you know, I had heard about Grossman, but it was not until uh, the early 90s that his book, an abridged version, gets published in English. And I was looking very, you know, I was anticipating it. I heard great things about Grossman. This was the guy who really, you know, returned to Marx's theory of crisis, this and that. And I looked at the, the book and I was, you know, I was disappointed. And, you know, I'm, I'm seeing this, this stuff and... It, there's a supposed breakdown, and it, 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 there were a lot of problems. It took me a while to figure out, you know, what exactly the problems were, because it's it, it, the the whole the whole model is is kind of a mess, as Grossman actually understood. You know, it was really a mess. But you know, for for decades, I've I've known some major problems exist with the, the whole model and with Grossman's explanation. That there's a crisis, there's a breakdown because there's supposedly not enough surplus value. I mean, for decades, literally, I've known that, you know, what is really going on is this physical imbalance in the reproduction scheme that Grossman inherited from um, Otto Bauer. And that physical imbalance is just not plausible. So I've known this, and it's like I had always better things to do, better things to do. Uh, and finally, basically, I was able to confirm that, I got some help, that the portions of Grossman's book that I was not privy to, because I'm reading from the English British version, there's nothing in the book that I didn't already know. Nothing I didn't already know is in the book that would cause me to change my conclusions you know, my judgment regarding the books. So I said, okay, here, you know, I'm not getting any younger. Uh, let me let me write this up because it's uh, it's important. I mean, I, I, I've come to realize over the years, especially very recently, how important it is. That it seems to me, I haven't done a, an actual survey, but it seems to me that most of the people who say and think that they like Marx's crisis theory it's it's actually Grossman or some version, you know, handed down, some second-hand version of Grossman that they like. It's nearly like people have seen the failure of a political revolutionary movement and they kind of go, oh, well, we can always fall back on, you know, what Grossman said about the breakdown theory. There's, there's definitely that. You know, uh, I have, a, as you know, uh, a section early on in, in my article where I talk about fatalism and the attraction of Grossman to fatalists. Even though Grossman himself was not a fatalist, his stuff is popular among those people who are fatalists. Yeah, And, and de definitely one of the, the, the attractions of fatalism is this, you know, idea like, well, the, you know, it's the, the breakdown of capitalism is coming anyway, even if we can't uh, hasten it, you know, it's, it's all going to work out in the end. So, Getting towards the, the paper, I must say, like, what's really great about the paper and what's kind of good about the use of mathematics in economics, you know, when it's not some... When you're ideological... not inverting a square matrix, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, when it's not just some ide ideological kind of uh, whatever or neoclassical or, or whatever is going on, that, like, you can take the person's arguments, what they say, write them down, and see clearly what the implications are. And when you when you do that, now I must say reading the paper, paper is quite long, but the math in it is really pretty simple. There's maybe one 
kind of tricky bit in the whole thing. It's not very difficult algebra to follow, and it, it gives a kind of devastating critique of the problems of Grossman's setup and Otto Bauer's setup. So, like, that's the one thing I'd like to say is that it's it's a re- it shows it's a really really good example of how math can clear up a very very simple like misunderstanding that forms the basis of a whole theory. Yeah, if 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 in fact it does, the math can show that. I mean, a lot of times it doesn't work like that. A lot of times people produce, you know, a mathematical refutation of this and that and the other thing, and they're smuggling in a lot of stuff that's actually not what the author said. You know, I'm very aware of that. But in this case, you know, I didn't have that problem, uh, or I had it much less than normal because... I'm working with an actual formal model that's specified in terms of, you know, numerical growth rates and, and, and everything. So I just had to look at the implications of that. And, you know, I try to make the, the mathematics as, as intelligible as possible. So I'm glad that you, you found it kind of like clear. Yeah, I found it also quite surprising, Andrew, like having read through all your Okisho papers and stuff like that, that we kind of nearly see a similar thing fall out of the math, which is that, you know, when in the previous stuff to do with the transformation problem, there was this idea of setting your input prices, your input and your output prices the same, so there's only one price. And what happens then is the labor time hours kind of get cancelled out and you end up with a relationship in the math of physical properties. And we kind of see the same thing here. It's nearly the exact same, well... It's in, done in a different way, but the same problem rears its head. Is that a fair comment? I, I'm not sure. I mean, one thing I am at pains to stress throughout the article is the physical quantities matter. You know, I've always said that the physical quantities don't determine value. They don't determine the total price. They don't determine the rate of profit. But they matter. They're there. And any decent plausible explanation of what's going on in terms of capital accumulation, uh, in terms of economic growth, in terms of economic crisis, any decent explanation has to take account of what's happening to the economy in physical terms. And, I mean, Bauer didn't do that, and Grossman didn't really do that. And as a result, you get stuff going on in the model that is, from a physical perspective, just wacky, to use the technical term. So I, I say you have to uh, pay attention to what's going on in the in the physical economy. I mean, for instance, just so everybody can follow this, Grossman says there's a breakdown in the model, the scheme of reproduction, after 35 years. Why? There's not enough surplus value, he says, to continue accumulation at the postulated rate. And that sounds... You know, that sounds really cool. You know, oh, not enough surplus value. There's a problem of valorization. Okay, however, when you look at the physical quantities that are associated with his breakdown condition, what it turns out to be is not enough surplus value turns out to mean that the amount of means of production and wage goods for the workers that are required next year the total of that is bigger than the amount of stuff that was produced this year to supply that. So it's a physical imbalance. And then, you know, like, well, why is there this physical imbalance? Right? No, actually, no good reason at all. And Grossman says this breakdown condition, I mean, before the economy collapses, there's actually, you know, an economic crisis. So it's not, not a once and for all collapse, there's an economic crisis. But the problem is, this economic crisis, so-called, caused by the so-called lack of surplus value, what it turns out to be is a crisis wherein not enough stuff is produced compared to the amount of stuff that's demanded. And the actual crises of capitalism are the exact opposite. Not too little supply compared to demand, but too little demand compared to supply. I'm not saying what the cause of the crisis is. I'm just saying what the phenomenon of the crisis is, is stuff is out there in the market, 
and it's not being sold because of the lack of demand. Okay, that's when you begin to get your downturn. What Grossman has actually modeled, whether he's understood it or not, is the exact opposite. Too much being demanded compared to what's being supplied. So, you know, you really can't have a decent explanation of economic slumps and crises if you're not even getting the phenomenon right. So the whole problem seems to stem from this idea. They're trying to, correct me if I'm wrong here, Andrew, they're trying to, in a crude way, trying to model essentially what I think is the rising organic composition of capital in the model. So they say that the constant capital versus the variable capital is growing at a faster percentage. So your amount of stuff that you're using for, well, there's no fixed capital in this. So say the amount of raw materials you're using is growing at a faster rate than your labor is. So you're getting an increase in technology. But how they model that is the problem in that they they keep the price of the input. So the price of these raw materials at the same value, yet there is a contradiction. How can it be the same value if it's being produced more efficiently? Absolutely correct. And this is something that Grossman was very well aware of. Uh, he inherited, you know, he took over this reproduction scheme that Otto Bauer had developed. Okay, so these problems of modeling technological progress kind of indirectly through constant capital growing faster than variable capital and new value. This was all there in Bauer. And Grossman takes over, he appropriates this and says, look, Bauer said that this thing doesn't break down, but that's only that's because he only looked at the first four years. Let's look at the process, you know, as it evolves through time, and lo and behold, there's a, there's a breakdown. But Grossman says, you know, the problem, just like you said, Tom, is that if you've got technological progress that's continual, you're going to get the price or the value of the commodity falling because uh, rise, technological progress means the productivity rises, it's cheaper to produce each unit, and that causes the price or the value uh, of a unit of output to, to fall. So, yeah, the whole thing just doesn't work. What Grossman does is say, look, within the confines of Bauer's model, here's even here's a breakdown. Now, we deal with some problems that are there in the model. One of the big ones is the, the fact that Bauer held the price or the value of the commodity constant. So, Grossman relaxes that really fatal <laughs> problem. He, he, he says, okay, you know, the, we're going to have rising productivity cheapen the commodity. And that's completely right to do, but he doesn't really show it. He just talks about it. And the way he talks about it is, is insufficient for the problem at hand. Okay. Cause the, the issue here is when you hold the price constant, then you get this breakdown. And what happens when you don't hold the price constant? When the price is falling, is your constant capital going to continue to grow? faster and faster without limit compared to the variable capital? Or will the price declines eventually cancel that out so that the constant capital does not rise in an unlimited way? You know, it rises, but not in an unlimited way compared to the variable capital. Grossman didn't know. He just sort of used his intuition and said, oh, well, what it does is the decline in the price slows down this process of growth of constant capital is against variable capital. So it just moves slower, but it, it's not going to be the case that the price declines are so big as to prevent, you know, to neutralize this tendency to break down. He had nothing on which to, to base that. Okay. It was, it was just his intuition. And, you know, what I show in the article is his, his intuition is wrong, at least if you are understanding the process of the determination of the price or the value in accordance with Marx's value theory. I'm able to show that if you have Marx's value theory being employed, then you, you don't get a breakdown. 
Yeah, so there's an interesting kind of finding you have in there when you apply like Marx's value theory to it. You end up with this result that the rate of capital, the rate of growth of constant capital has to, in the limit, approach the rate of growth of value in the system as a whole. That's a kind of an interesting finding. It It is. I mean, to me, it's kind of obvious, but I have intuitions that are different from a lot of people's intuitions because, you know, they've come through over the years. Here's my intuition. If the growth of total value is being driven by new value coming into the system, then in, you know, in the limit, okay, value is going to be growing at the rate of growth of, of the new value. That's the intuition. Okay. People don't see it, but to me, it's, it's kind of obvious that, you know, in, in the limit, total value is not going to rise faster. The, the growth rate of, of, of value is not going to be faster than the growth rate of new value. And that means that that, that governs then the, the, the price of the commodity and that I won't go through all every step here, but basically that means you, you're, you're not going to get a breakdown because the, Grow in the in the limit the growth of the circulating capital, the means of production in physical terms will be uh, offset by the fall in 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 the value per unit. Uh, I should say something, just a, a minor terminological point that was brought to my attention. Grossman says that there is fixed capital in his model. I say that there isn't fixed capital in his model. I don't think that that's a contradiction. I think what he means by fixed capital is stuff like machines and tools and structures, you know, factory buildings and and so forth. And we often call that fixed capital. I'm using the term fixed capital in a different sense, technical sense, more appropriate to what I'm doing, which is to say that all of the means of production that are employed in production are used up during the period. None of them persist in physical form in the production process after the one period. Okay, that, that's a, a different sense of the word fixed capital. Right, so it's like circulating fixed capital. Nearly. <laughs> it's circulating capital, including circulating capital of the kinds of things that are commonly called fixed capital. Okay, so the, the point is, Grossman's got machines but his machines are all used up during the year. You know, he's got factory buildings, but they only last a year. So let's talk a little bit about this limit then, this idea that the value, the rate of the growth of constant value in the limit due to the cheapening of the inputs, the physical inputs for the for the constant capital, it reaches the same rate of growth as value overall. That to me, I, I find... Like I follow the math, yeah, I go cool, that's grand. But it, 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 at some level, I'm, I'm kind of confused still because, like, to me, you know, Marx's insight is that overall the rate of constant capital does grow, does become bigger than the than the variable capital element. That's the you know the falling rate of profit. How do you square that limit function? Like, can you can you explain that to me? Because I'm slightly confused by that. I must admit. I, I I think you're probably not as confused as you're indicating you are. Things can grow, and they can grow forever. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they grow without a limit. For those who are thinking in terms of a graph, imagine time on your horizontal axis, and you got your ratio of, let's say, constant to variable capital, or whatever it will be. Okay? So... As you go to the right on your horizontal axis, as you move forward in time, the constant capital grows as against the variable capital. So your your curve is upward sloping. Okay, but that doesn't mean that that curve that's upward sloping increases without limit, you know, from one to two to four to eight, I mean, it, it, you know, or even one to two to three to four to five to six to seven. The curve can... The rate of growth slows down. Um, the, the rate of growth slows down. So the curve can increase, can rise, but rise at a decreasing rate. 
Okay, and so it's just there's a deceleration of uh, something that's increasing. It's like you bring your car onto the highway, you know, and because you're getting onto the highway, you're accelerating very fast. Okay, so you're not only going faster, but you're going faster at a very rapid clip. Then you know, once you're on the road, you still might be going faster, but you're decelerating. The rate at which your speed is increasing is becoming less and less. Okay, I'm talking about something very similar. Okay, so eventually you hit whatever you want to hit. I mean, in miles per hour, it might be you know 60. In kilometers, it might be 100. You know, so you're doing 100 on the road. Okay, so at that point, you're no longer going any faster at all. You know, but you went from 30 to 60 to 80 to 85 to 87. Right? Like that. So, so con- yeah, I mean, constant capital can, can grow forever relative to, I mean, to speak, you know, in a strange way. It can grow forever as against variable capital, but that doesn't mean it cre- increases without limit, okay, measuring on your vertical axis. But if both, uh, say, for example, if both constant capital and variable capital both are essentially growing in the limit at the same rate, that means that the rate of kind of the organic composition stabilizes? Uh, well, the value composition, yes. But keep in mind that in the context of this Grossman, Bauer-Grossman model, there is nothing that I'm calling fixed capital. If you had fixed capital, it would be a somewhat different set of issues we'd have to deal with. Okay, once you have the fixed capital in, you have essentially things involved in the equation that are from previous times, which drag down certain elements in those growth trajectories yes i mean especially right i mean so right it it becomes a more complex problem although in general you know in general let me say i don't find in simulations that i do that uh even with you know fixed capital in the sense of means of production that lasts more than one period i don't find that the constant capital grows without limit in general. I don't find the constant capital grows without limit relative to the, the new value added in production. Right, so it, it tends to a, a kind of a limit. Yes, but, but the in models general. We're, yeah, the models we're building are not, they're not real life models though. So the dynamics are, are will, like the actual crisis dynamics will, will be largely omitted from these models, won't they? Yes, I mean, uh, first, I mean, they're not models, really, but I don't do models. Like, uh, they're not models of reality, they're models right, of Right, and they're, they're, not, they're, they're not meant to model crisis, among other things, they're not meant to model crisis. So, it would just be, to give you an example, let's say the means of production, including the, the fixed capital, including the circulating means of production, constant capital, Let's say that that grows at 4% per year. And the labor, employed labor force and the new value increased by 1% per year. Okay. And then how, on the basis of Marx's value theory with those numbers, uh, how does the economy evolve? Okay. Now, what you get is at that point, you know, you're going to get a fall in the rate of profit. And in reality, what you're going to get is various responses on the part of the capitalists to the fall on the rate of profit. Okay, so if you were building a model, you would look at all of that. Okay, but let's say that's not what you're interested in for some reason. Maybe you say, okay, if this process were to continue, where would it end up? When all is said and done, where would the economy be heading toward? So I I ask a lot of questions like that. It's kind of like you're looking at, say, the maybe the first and second order effects of value theory, but not the third and fourth and fifth and sixth that happen in the real world. Yeah, you can put it like that. Yeah, and 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 it's because questions like where is this process headed? You know, if it is, if it were to be left uninterrupted, where would this process be heading? That in itself, I think, is a legitimate question, and it. You know, it sheds a lot of light on the, the dynamics. And then you could do things like compare that to, you know, what the Akisha theorem says and so forth and so on. There's a lot of questions that are, I think, important questions that are helpful to 
know the answers to that are not, let me build a model of here's how the economy actually works. Okay, the, the moment you, you start to do too much of that, here's how the economy actually works, you run into a problem of you got so much going on that you can't figure out what's cause, what's effect, what's just, you know, a byproduct, just like in reality, right? They, you know, all this stuff is going on. We don't know what's cause. We don't know what's effect. We don't know what's just plain byproduct. So this is why you need, you know, theoretical investigation and analysis, and you break things down, and you hold this constant, you hold that constant. You, you, you're trying to get at what's cause, what's effect. Here's an explanation of the process, not just a reproduction of the process. Right. You know, it's like the difficulty of doing an IPCC model, isn't it? You can't model for, the, for a new technology in the IPCC report. That reference has gone over my head. Right, you know the environmental, the IPCC, the 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 one, the 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 big UN climate prediction models. They have the IPCC report. They have uh, the IPCC I, I, report. I I don't really know anything about them. Yeah, they're incredibly complex. You know, they have. It's like trying to model, you know, like capitalism. Like you can model all these different elements you think are correct, but you like the it's an it's impossible in to know it in its totality. You can't you can't model the invention of a new solar panel that's eighty percent better than the existing one. You can't really model those effects. You can model maybe natural processes, but when it comes to like you know the the more economic process, it it becomes it's essentially impossible. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't know any. I mean, I don't know anything about that, but I know economic models, and what I know is you. Know, they're just like making sausage. You, you don't want to see how it's done. <laughs> I, I didn't make that up. That's a that's a standard. Standard line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's kind of to 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 try and tease out for somebody listening, like the the kind of difference between kind of what I see as a kind of a. When I when I think of Marx's break, I won't say breakdown theory, crisis theory, and I look at the empirical evidence, to me, I see the tendency of capitalism is not towards breakdown like that Grossman has put forward, but it seems to me towards a stagnation, as in the you know the organic composition capital has raised over time, but if we to look to the last say. 30 years essentially it's stuck in the doldrums it's not able to let itself nearly have a crisis big enough to allow itself to reboot so it's stuck in a low profitability zone so to me marx's theory seems to point towards stagnation as opposed to breakdown what do you make of that general way of describing the situation you've characterized what marx's theory says by pointing to your evaluation of reality uh, okay. Which one should not do. <laughs> Marx's theory is Marx's theory, and the situation of the last 30 years is the situation of the last 30 years, or maybe now it's going, well, really, it's since uh, the mid-70s. I, agr- I, I, I agree fundamentally, uh, wholeheartedly, really, with what you said to characterize, you know, the more or less semi-stagnation, slow growth, doldrums that much of the world economy has been in. You know, the United States certainly for a very, very long period. It doesn't seem to me that Marx's theory tells us anything one way or another about. I mean, generally we get this issue of, you know, well, you can drag things out, prevent the destruction of capital value, and you're going to have slow growth because you got a lot of, you know, capital weighing down the rate of profit and stuff, you know, or you could have a crisis that's, you know, long and deep and purges the system, you know, you, you get wipeouts, you get bankruptcies, you get all that, and then they can regenerate. So you, you, you kind of have that tension. I don't think Marx's theory tells us one way or another, although, of course, when he was writing, he was not living in a period of active government management of the economy. So if you don't have the active management of the economy, 
to throw, you know, more debt to cover over previous bad debt, you're going to tend to have the crises that purge the system rather than, you know, this kind of managed semi-stagnation. But that's, those would not be what I would think of as elements of his theory, but more elements of his just analysis of what's going on at the time. So I, I, I don't think that, that the theory can tell us one way or, or another, and in principle, both things are, are, are possible. You know, right. just dragging it out by covering over bad debt with more debt, etc. There's other things that they can do. Or, you know, you, 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 you let everything rip and, and it does. <laughs> Yeah, like, let, so I probably should have, I, I, I worded it quite clumsily. What I would say now, what I would say, if I'd be more precise, it would be that the bourgeoisie at the moment are seeking stagnation over a purge. Uh, I don't know. I mean, what, what do they do? They, they don't have like bourgeoisie conferences as such. They have central bankers, you know. Right. The central bankers in the advanced countries. Definitely, I think have that that outlook, sure. But your 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 merger and acquisition people who are also big capitalists, they would rather have it the other way. So you're you're talking about like the, the vulture funds? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let it rip. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if if you know you 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 want these these companies that you can buy up, you you want them to crash so you can buy them up on the cheap, and you want a lot of them available. So it's you know it's not like the capitalist class has like you know one set of interests that you know they're they're agreed on and that they try to put into effect. Yeah, and they do have you know these things have tendencies to uh, move and shift over time. With you know complex systems can shift from long periods of of a single state and then just like flip to a new state. Uh, so who knows what the hell is coming? Um, let me see here. Okay, there's one thing here you said in the paper, which I found very interesting, Andrew. It was a little bit of empirical evidence to show how kind of crazy the assumptions in the model were. So this was the idea that constant capital grows at 10% an annum and the living labor grows at 5% an annum per annum. So that, that's how they tried to model this falling rate of profit in their model. You said here that in the U.S. economy, the amount, the capital output ratio, which tends towards one in Gross and Bauer, so everything is uh, constant capital versus labor. In America, it's fifty three point four percent. That's the I'm staggered by that. Right, and and and, and, and there's, there's a little bit of text where I say this is exclusive of fixed capital. You know, if you were to look at the total fixed and circulating capital compared to output, I mean, it's, uh, I don't know, four, five, six, I don't know how, it's, it's huge, okay? Okay, yeah. But, but if you're just looking at something that's approximately, I've, obviously we have a, an economy that produces all kinds of things, so you can't say, you know, how much means of production per unit of physical output. But speaking in that way, Okay. Yeah, the amount of means of production needed to produce a unit of physical output is around one half. And it's been one half, like, you know, for as long as I can remember. It doesn't, it doesn't move. That's even interesting by itself that it doesn't move. Like that there seems to be some law of, not law, but some relationship between the amount that is spent on wages and the amount that is spent on circulating capital. Yeah. Right, your gross output, what they call it. That's like the total price of all the output. About half of it is your means of production and your depreciation of fixed capital. And the rest is, you know, your net value added or, you know, what Marx calls new value added. So that's about half. And, you know, in the U.S. economy, about 30% of that, you know, goes to wages and benefits and, and 20% to profits and taxes and stuff like that. Now, is there, is there anything else, Andrew, we haven't hit from in the paper? Well, we, we, we kind of talked about a couple of issues that I think are extremely important, but I don't know how much like listeners could pick up on them. One is the issue of the need to root these kinds of investigations not only in value. You know, here's the movement of value. 
But to understand that value does not move on its own in abstraction from use value, in abstraction from the physical quantities, you know, that's not there in Bauer, it's not there in Grossman, and in 90 years of commentary, people have, surprisingly to me, just sort of thought that you can talk about what's going on with the values, and you can ignore what's going on with the physical quantities, and you don't have to make sure that the things mesh or that the underlying physical scenario, you know, is plausible at all. But as a result of his inattention to what was going on on the physical side of the economy, Grossman, first of all, just characterized the cause of breakdown in a very misleading way. As I said, it's, you know, he says there's not enough surplus value. It's a problem of valorization. Well, what he had, you know, what he was actually modeling, although he didn't know it, was not enough stuff is produced compared to the demand for the stuff, you know, for means of production and, and workers' wages in the next period. So, you know, what I'm hoping that people will do is to realize that you can't just, like, stipulate some abstraction, you know, constant capital grows at 10% per year, variable capital grows at 5% per year. Well, why? You can't say that's a law of capitalist production. Marx didn't do this kind of thing at all. You know, you look at what Marx does, Marx gets his value numbers by taking prices and taking physical quantities and doing the multiplications. For instance, you look at the, the chapter on the labor process and the valorization process in volume one of capital. You know, he doesn't just, just say, well, you know, there's uh, 400 pounds of constant capital that gets transferred. He says, there's this much cotton and there's this much wear and tear on the spindle and it costs this much. And blah, 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 he, he works through all the calculations, you know, building up the, the value numbers on the basis of the physical quantities and, and the prices. And that's really the only way to do it. Otherwise, you just don't know. For instance, you know, you, you buy jelly beans, you know, and this year, 20 quid. And next year, it's 25 quid. Well, okay, so you're spending 20% more on jelly beans. Well, why is that? You consuming more jelly beans? Or is it just that the price has gone up? How do you know? Well, you have to know the physical quantities, and you have to know the price of jelly beans, right? There's no other way. If you don't have that kind of information, how much physical stuff, you know, and the price per unit, if you don't know that, you can tell any story you want, but it's, it's all made up. And that's, that, that, that's fundamentally what's wrong with the way that Grossman tried to fix the problems in the scheme of reproduction that he took over from Otto Bauer. Grossman gives us all of these value numbers, this amount of constant capital, that amount of variable capital, that amount of surplus value, so much of the surplus value goes here, some of, so much of it goes there, its rate of growth is this, its rate of growth is that. He's very meticulous, painstaking, year after year, three and a half decades, tracing this all in terms of value. Then he says, wait a minute, all of this is wrong because Bauer has this continual technological change, but he's not letting the price of the commodity or the value of the commodity fall, even though in reality, rising productivity cheapens commodities. So rising productivity, we got to recognize that it cheapens commodities. Okay, so he's doing everything right. but then." He doesn't do with the physical quantities what he did with the values. There's no calculations. There's no tables. If he had, you know, computed what is going on with the values or the price in terms of the, the physical quantities, he would have come to a very different conclusion. And how do I know that? Because I've done it, and I've come to a very different conclusion, right? And it's the only conclusion one can draw on the basis of Marx's value theory, okay? And the conclusion is that when you let the price of the commodity fall in accordance with rising productivity, the constant capital no longer grows in an unlimited fashion as against the new value in the variable capital. Okay, so there is no breakdown. There is no moment where the mass of profit is insufficient in the specific sense that uh, Grossman meant. Okay, 
But because Grossman did not do the calculations, you know, he just sort of talked about, you know, the, the cheapening of the commodity and its effects, but he was using his intuition and he was guessing and he was getting, he got, he got it wrong. So th- these two parts of the story, you know, Grossman made a valiant effort to fix the model, but he didn't go far enough. Okay, because he did not compute his physical quantities and his per unit prices. He just guessed at what the effects would be. And he guessed that, well, the process, the process still it tends to break down just more slowly. It's just the moment of breakdown is postponed. But he didn't know that. He could not have known that without doing the calculations in terms of the physical quantities. And so he guessed, and, and he got it wrong. Like, it, it says something very important, like that, you know, you, you, can't, you can't excise, like, the use value from the value. The two are a part of a dialectical whole. You, you can't separate them for any type of analysis. Yeah, it's a breath mint, it's a candy mint, it's two, two, two mints in one. So, like, <laughs> it was a certs. We used to have a mint called certs. And it would be both of them. It's a breath mint and it's a candy mint, you know? But I mean, values, like I said, they, they don't move on their own in abstraction from the use values, you know? Why, why, are, you, why are you spending more on jelly beans? Well, it's it might not- be because you're eating more jelly beans. No, it's, it, you know what it is, Andrew? It's, it's that, that ship that was stuck in the Suez Canal. That's why they're gone up. That's what it is. It could be the price of the jelly beans rises, but it, it, it's going to be one or the other or some, or some combination. combination of both. And it could, it, could be, it could be many different possibilities, and we're never going to know which one it is. But in any case, you can't just like, sit back and say, ah, oh, there's a law of capitalism that you know, uh, we're going to pay 20% more for jelly beans every year. Well, no, you can't, you can't say that. You've got to say, well... You know, maybe the, the the world supply of jelly beans can't keep up to that 20%, you know? And maybe that the price of jelly beans is going to fall such that you're going to be able to consume more jelly beans, you know, and not pay more. I mean, you you got to pay attention to, to both sides, the physical and, 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 and the value. So let, let's say something a bit positive then about the book. It's a good few years. I did read it about six or seven years ago. And what what I got from it, you know, I probably wasn't paying close enough attention from that. I found the models a bit, personally, I kind of found them a bit basic, you know, and that's probably why I found them basic. I kind of found them a bit arbitrary. But the thing that I actually got from the book was, I think, in like in one large section where he goes into a huge amount of kind of counteracting tendencies to the fall in the rate of profit. Like, it seems to me that he went into more kind of examples of tendencies than Marx did in volume three. Am I, am, am I misremembering there? Or am I? No, I mean, uh, yeah, that's a very large portion of the book. And so what he's trying to do is to, I mean, he uses the term counteracting tendencies or counter something modifications, modifying counter tendencies, something like that. So that's terminology from Marx, but that, this is basically Grossman's attempt to grapple with the insufficiencies of this model from Bauer that he, you know, the scheme of reproduction he inherited from Bauer and to say, you know, look, I know that capitalism does not evolve according to the prices remaining constant, but we got technological change and the the constant capital grows at 10% a year and the variable capital new value grow at 5% a year. There's a lot of things that go on. So he, he talks about these in terms of modifying counter tendencies, and that is a big chunk of the book. And yes, it's much more uh, in depth than what Marx was doing, because it's not really about the fall in the rate of profit so much as it's about this breakdown tendency. There is no breakdown tendency in, in Marx's crisis theory, as I discuss in the, in, in, in the article. You know, there are crises, and you know, there's a fall in the rate of profit, but there's no breakdown in the Grossman style wherein the mass of profit stagnates or becomes insufficient for something uh, in any way. So, I mean, Grossman is dealing in, in great detail, for instance, with this issue of 
what does export of capital do? What does imperialism do? How does this modify the system and so forth? And Marx, you know, of course, didn't prepare volume three of Capital where he talked about the modifying counter tendencies. He didn't work that up for publication. So his list of counteracting factors is basically taken from John Stuart Mill. And he, you know, he noted them. But anyway, it, it's kind of hard to compare Mark, Marx and Grossman in, in this vein because their theories are actually quite different. I have a question for you. Have you had any pushback yet? Yes. Sure. I mean, if you look below my article at the comments section, you will see discussion between me and Peter Jones. Uh, and at the moment, he's gotten the last say, but I intend to answer him. I mean, what I find really disheartening uh, about his response, what he, let me just say, what he's trying to do is rescue this idea of of absolute overaccumulation of capital, that, you know, there's this point where the massive profit just becomes, it's impossible for the system to go on without a crisis. So he, he produced this model, and, I mean, this model that he produced generates the result that he wanted, okay, but it does so by doing everything that I said you shouldn't do in the article, imposing some arbitrary growth rate of value magnitudes from the outside, okay? And he uh, doesn't look at the process of valuation, the determination of the price of the commodity. He doesn't say, okay, this is endogenous. Uh, this happens within the valuation process of the economy. He imposes that exogenously from the outside as well. And by saying, here's how the total value magnitudes, you know, grow, and here's how the per unit thing grows or shrinks by 2% per year, he has basically forced the physical quantities to fit this set of assumptions of his. And this set of assumptions of his is, like, just not grounded. And, you know, I mean, for instance, he says that constant capital as a share of total capital increases by 1% per year. Well, if you think about it, constant capital as a share of total capital increasing by 1% per year, eventually it's going to be more than 100%. How can, how can the constant capital be more than 100% of the total capital? Well, it can't, okay? But in his, in his model it is, and as a result, the variable capital becomes negative after a while, which means that, you know, the new value being created by the workers and the surplus value becomes negative. And of course, that's, that's going to generate a crisis either at that moment that becomes negative or actually, you know, all along, the economy is driving towards that. So problems appear from the very beginning. You know, in his, his model, you've got from the very beginning this mysterious thing going on where the growth rate of everything is declining. Why? Well, we, we don't know. You know, it's just all in service of producing this, you know, insufficiency of the mass of profit. So I, I found it very disheartening because I'm saying, you know, what you need is a plausible physical process. You need to be able to compute the price per unit and then your physical quantities and the price per unit that tells you how the value magnitudes grow. And I, I just find it disheartening that that message, which is just like, it's all obvious. Yeah. It, it, it's, like... it's, it's disheartening that he hasn't taken this to heart. And as a result, I just, I, it's hard for me even to discuss his stuff because I'm like, you know, you, you can get a result that seems plausible to you, but if the process that's generating it is not plausible, there's no reason to take it seriously as far as I can see. Yeah, like it's not Marx's theory, is it? It's just some other theory. I look, I think Marx was smart enough not to have a theory in which some, you know, inexorable law imposes itself on capitalists that they have to allocate their capital such that more than all of the capital is spent on constant capital and you know, a negative amount on on, on variable capital and there's, you know, negative workers, you know, not working in the not factories. I mean, I, I yeah. don't know. 
like it's like I don't know if we if we really explicitly dealt with it, but in the paper you get into this idea explicitly of how this ten percent growth rate that Grossman puts into the system as a it's an exogenous fa- kind of a factor that it's just determined from outside, not within the relations of the economic system itself. And it seems like Peter Jones, I haven't read his stuff, but it's like he's saying, well, okay, let's not go to ten percent. Let's try one percent. That's not doesn't seem too much, does it? And look, it still happens. Yeah, but it's even worse because it's not 1% growth of constant capital. It's 1% growth of constant capital as a share. As a share. That's what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I mean, okay. that, that's even, that's okay, even, yeah. that's, that's even worse because I can imagine it, it's more imaginable the constant capital grows at 10% per year. <laughs> it's yeah. okay for, forever. That, that, that's somewhat imaginable. It's just not at all imaginable that constant capital grows by 1% a year as a share of total capital, so that eventually it's 98, 99, 100, 101, 103, 107%. That, that just that can't be. Is this Peter Jones? I've just looked him up. Is he from, is he Australian? Yes. Yeah. No, that sounds, that sounds pretty ridiculous. Like it's, when you read the, when you, again, for the listeners, if you're afraid of the maths or whatever, but like when you read the paper and the maths is not that, not that hard now, I must say, there's no hiding there's there's just no hiding place from from us you know there's there's nowhere to go it's like to to shift the growth from the constant capital to the percentage of the value of the constant capital is that seems like the most arbitrary goddamn shift you could possibly yeah i mean try to do. i i don't know i don't want to like impugn his motives i mean i get a sense that he was just looking for some quick way to model the result that he wanted you know and my point is, you, you, that's just not tenable. And I mean, he was saying, well, you know, I didn't, I didn't carry out the calculations as far as you do so that this and that becomes negative, you know, like the amount of workers becomes negative. I only took it to nine years and, you know, there's a crisis. It, the problem is, this is the kind of response that, uh, Helene Bauer gave to, uh, Heinrich Grossman. Well, Otto, you know, my husband, my collaborator, he only did four years. You know, by what right do you have, what right do you have to carry this out to 35 years and say the system breaks down? He did four years and he said there wasn't a breakdown. What's the problem? I mean, it's the same kind of response. The point is one wants to understand the tendencies of a system. Okay. So you take things to, to, to their limit. You take things, you extend them forward in time and you see what the evolution of the process is. And if the process does not make any sense, there is no reason to accept, you know, moments prior to, you know, the, the 35th period or whatever, you know, when, if you begin to see, you know, that for no reason at all, you're starting from a situation where the growth rate of everything is declining, you have to say, well, how did that come about? And if you don't have, you know, anything that can explain to you why that's come about, you, you, you really don't have anything. Basically, somebody might as well write down you know, without any justification whatsoever, you know, the massive profit stagnates. Sure, you can do that. Here's my theory of the massive profit stagnating. It's right here. The massive profit stagnates. End of story. I mean, you know, you could, you could do that. You could tell any story you want. The question of its plausibility goes into what are the processes that are generating these outcomes. And... I, I don't think there's any plausibility uh, in terms of the processes that are generating the outcomes in, in, in what Peter Jones has tried to do. I have another question for you. You said that there's the new translation is coming out, I think, by Rick Kuhn. Is that who you said? Yes. And the, the, the co-translator is the translator of the um, uh, abridged edition, Jairus Banaji. All right. Yeah. And have they read your paper yet? Or where do they stand? Or what would like... What's the I, 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 I've, I've actually never, for you know, just not for any reasons that I wanted. I, I haven't ever had any contact with Banaji. I've had contact with Rick Kuhn, and in fact, how I got back to this this issue in recent months is he was working on finalizing the manuscripts for you know printing and, and, and publication uh, of this translation, and he wanted some assistance with the computations of this uh, Otto Bauer model, not the the simple one-sector model, because Bauer did two departments and got a little bit complex. So I I helped him with this, 
I said, you know, by the way, Rick, you know, I'm really not interested in the, the details of, of this reproduction scheme because it just doesn't work. And I laid out to him uh, some of what I, I put in the, uh, the article and we've been discussing today. And I, we had a little back and forth with that. And he was very helpful to me because he, he, he supplied portions of the translated text of the translation that just came about, the full translation rather than the abridged one. And that allowed me to confirm that there wasn't anything that Grossman had said that contradicted my understanding of the defects of the model and the procedure by which he meant to correct it and, and so forth. So that was the point where I was able to actually, you know, sit down and write this paper because it was like, you know, as I was saying in the beginning, and I knew as I was on a solid, solid foundation, I hadn't misinterpreted. Without wanting to, yeah, I don't want to like disclose private communications that the other party might want to keep private. It's clear to me that Rick Kuhn has seriously read my article, and he has written to me about numerous aspects, and, and I've responded. So I, I don't wish to characterize his position, because actually I don't know, know overall his, his position. Cool. Fair enough. We might see when we get the, when the new edition comes out. When's it due out, you know? I believe it's out. I believe I saw a, uh, you know, a notice from the publisher. You know, they only want like 300 quid in your first firstborn first male child or something. I mean, it, it, it's an exorbitant amount of money. Hopefully they'll come out with a, uh, a paper edition soon. 190 pounds, $229. Literature for the masses, Andrew. Literature for the masses. That was a long one, Andrew. That was like 32 pages on the browser. Like. Yeah, it, it's it's long. I mean, part of the reason it was long is I was trying to explain math to a non-mathematical audience, and I was trying to explain things in an understandable way about endogenous determination and exogenous determination to an audience that might not be familiar with it. You know, I could have made it a lot shorter. I mean, like, if I were writing this in an economics journal, I would yeah. just, you know, say, the first yeah. derivative is this, I okay, <laughs> right? And therefore, yeah. it's convergent and blah, 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 right? I went through, like, just painstakingly, you know, what that implied. And, yeah, but no, it was very long. I, I figured, like, look, I'm getting old. You know, this is my one shot, and, you know, it's on, it's on a website, it's not in a journal, so I didn't have to worry about that, you know, that problem of, of scrunching everything, making it fit the size, and you, you lose, you lose things when, when, when that happens. I, I didn't, I didn't need to do that. You know, I don't think it's a paper for one sitting, but, uh, it's, the, like you say, the, 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 the actual math and the, and the deductions and stuff, the, the, it's not that hard. It's like literally the only thing was that convergent series or whatever. You know, yeah. The derivative of it. That's like, apart from that, it's just n manipulation of algebra. Right. The, the, the really tricky thing is to come to grips with, and I had a lot of trouble. The really tricky thing was to come to grips with what I had proven and what I hadn't proven. You know, I proved that there is no structural tendency to break down you know, if you endogenize the valuation according to Marx's value theory. And I proved that for the long run, right? It doesn't prove that, you know, you couldn't have a breakdown, you know? And so I say a number of times, and that doesn't prove... But then I said, you know, it's not plausible, and I went into, here is why it's not plausible, and here's what I mean by implausible. But, you know, people who think that they can tell whatever story of value they want and let the physical quantities just kind of hang out there, you know, realistic, unrealistic, because, you know, they're not taking it to the limit. Um, I don't know what to say. I mean, are you going to, look, you going every, to everything, I, everything I've always done is always like this. People, they don't want to get over it. You know, you just want to say, yeah. get over it, get over this stagnation yeah. of the mass of profit. Get, and, and they don't want to, they want to hang on to what they've been doing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what is it? Is it uh, physics proceeds one death at a time or something? I, that he might have that. been Max Planck. Planck, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah it might, might have been him. He said old uh, ideas don't die because their proponents become convinced that they're wrong. 
the old ideas die because the old generation dies and a new generation comes along that's familiar. That's great, Andrew. Thanks for coming on the show today. Oh, thank you very much, Tom. I enjoyed it. Thank you for inviting me. You will provide the, the URL. I will indeed. And also, there is a Spanish translation of the article, and if you go to the URL that Tom's going to give you, you can get to the Spanish translation that way. And also, there is a forthcoming German translation. Uh, and I'm you know, especially pleased because that's the original language in which Grossman wrote this.